Hello. But first of all, I would like to thank Valerie, Corinne, and all the staff here at FAT. I'm, I'm really, really honored, actually, to be here uh, for um, Scholar of My Generation. Is, uh, the people who have been speaking today has been a, a big inspiration, for at least for me. I would like also to thank uh, my assistant, uh, uh, Parson Paris, and also my colleagues and friends, Antoine Boucher, Miren Arzalutz, and Laurent Cotta, who, since I arrived in Paris, have been uh, really of uh, great help, and it's been a pleasure to discuss with them during these three years. Uh, I'm not sure about the... How do I change? Like this? Well, okay. So for today, Valerie asked me to present the contemporary scene of fashion exhibition and museum in Paris. Uh, but to do so, I'd like to start from the past, actually. And specifically, an article published in 1951 on Le Figaro, written by André Billy, and brought to my attention by my colleague Antoine Boucher. Titled Pour un musée de costume, uh, the article is a profound reflection on the need of a fashion museum in Paris. Here, Billy reconstructs, it's a short article, but Billy says quite a lot of important things. First of all, he reconstructs a short history on fashion museum and institutions in Paris, like La Société de l'Histoire du Costume, which was founded in 1907, the Union Française des Arts de Costume, 1948. He also mentioned the institution in 1920, of an early ephemeral museum of fashion at l'Hotel Madrazzo. And finally, denounced the governmental lack of attention towards fashion and its cultural value. Billy reflects on the contradictions between the centrality of Paris for the fashion industry and the dismissal of fashion as a cultural value in museums, at, at its time, of course. He defines, and I'm quoting, this is as something more than just a paradox. It's an absurd scandal, end of the quote. This latter expression that I also use as a title of this talk <clears throat> is an interesting and fertile idea to think about the state of fashion museum in Paris today. The paradox denounced by Billy has today expanded in some more other form of paradoxical discourses about fashion and its ideologies in museums, but also about today's role of fashion in museum in France and specifically in Paris. A paradox is also at the basis of a study of fashion in museum in academia, I, uh, I, I argue. While French creation have been seminal to the institution of fashion collection abroad, there's been very little reconstruction of these museological histories in relation to France. Apart from few reviews uh, on fashion exhibition and, few, and some articles on early museological experiences written by Bas Kruger or uh, uh, Damien Delisle, or even uh, Julia Petro mentioned before some examples, there's been indeed a lack of specific studies about French fashion museography and even a history of exhibition in France uh, from both Anglo-Saxon and even French academic world. Figures, figures like Maurice Leloir, François Boucher, uh, more recently Madeleine Delpierre or Yvonne Delandre, uh, have been playing a central role in the definition and formation of fashion in museum in France. To some extent, these figures have been in some ways overlooked, despite, innovative, uh, despite creating innovative cases in the history of exhibitions. And of course, here I just want to mention two examples. This was a catalog created uh, when Galliera reopened in 77, where Delpierre reconstructs in the, in the introduction a first history of exhibition in Paris. And another one is the exhibition Moment de Mode, which opened uh, the section on fashion and les arts décoratifs, and, and it's a very interesting case of questioning canons of collecting and exhibiting fashion in museums. Such a lack is both connected to, of course, a linguistic predominance of the English language, and therefore a predominant history of English and, and American exhibitions in the study of fashion curating, but also a lack of academic studies on fashion in France. Therefore, the need to rewrite a history of fashion curating in France has indeed become an urgency, uh, also an exercise of contextualization, I would say, for the arising of exhibition, blockbuster exhibition like Dior, the creation of personal museums like Saint Laurent, but also the reconfiguration of public museums like Galliera, which will soon reopen with a permanent collection permanent exhibition, sorry. So what is the role of fashion in museum in France? What type of ideologies have been embedded in these institutions? And most importantly, what is the role played by the industry in the construction of discourses about fashion in museums? So in this talk, I will begin to answer to these questions, presenting some cases that I found particularly interesting uh, in relation to this question in the last three, four years. So my selection of these cases focuses on their capacity to let emerge some discursive patterns and ideologies attached to the idea of fashion in museums in Paris. Because of time, I will not be able to give justice, I, I just want to say this, uh, 
because exhibitions are very complex, as we saw uh, all day, very complex entities. So I would just mention some of the elements connected to this exhibition. So I would not be able, actually, to give justice to them uh, and their complexity. Uh, but my aim is really to focus on the issues and discourses they, er, they, they let emerge. Here, with the term discourse, I refer to the work of uh, a French, uh, Dutch uh, critical theorist, Mike Ball, and her Foucauldian analysis of museums, uh, of museums in a in famous article, The Discourse of Museums, in the book Thinking About Exhibitions, which is, uh, I believe, an approach that has been proliferating in art, gender, and post-colonial studies in relation to the study of museums, but could, uh, should become even more adopted in relation to studies on fashion curating. So the first and most evident pattern still developed in museums in Paris has been connected to the myth of a designer, or I should say the couturier. Uh, as more than 11 exhibitions from 2015 until today have been dedicated to French houses and their creators like Alaya, Lambin, or Hermès. In this sense, the most interesting case, I believe, is the Saint Laurent Museum, which represents the first attempt to create a museum on a fashion couturier in the space of a former fashion house. Started as a foundation in March 2004, the institution was then transformed into a museum in 2018, becoming another example of monographic museums uh, dedicated to one single person, like in the case, for example, Balenciaga, and many other examples in uh, art discipline in, in France, in Paris especially. Differently from other cases, this museum in, in many ways uh, is a result of a double, project, uh, of a double self projection and self institutionalization. On one side, we have Saint Laurent himself, who consciously acted as a collector, conserving prototypes uh, of his own creation and marking them with a letter M for museum. On the other side, we have the work of Pierre Beger, who uh, passed away a few months before the opening of the museum, uh, but who was a key figure in the establishment and mythologization of Saint Laurent. As the uh, scenographer and exhibition designer Nathalie Crenier explained, the aim was to provoke in a visitor, and I'm quoting, a sentiment of wonder and beauty by going through, and I'm quoting again, spaces which are inhabited by the presence of Saint Laurent, end of the quote. The centrality of the maker is particularly embodied in the room six of the museum, which is titled The Studio, which is probably the most evident example of this sort of uh, reincarnation of Saint Laurent in the space. Here, visitors can enter a reconstructed version of the atelier room where Saint Laurent was working and where everything seemed to be left untouched, or I rather should say, preserved in action. As it's possible to read from the website and caption introducing the space, the studio is defined, and I'm quoting, the designer heaven. A linguistic analysis of this caption can easily explain the type of association created by, between the work of a designer and a sort of mystical approach to the creative process. In many ways, the mise-en-scene performs a sort of diorama where pencils, rubbers, art books, sketches, handwritten letters to clients, and even Saint Laurent iconic glasses are carefully positioned on his desk, enacting a sort of mess of the creative process or the presence of a designer which is interestingly rematerialized in a sort of a Saint Laurent mood board, which is not a mood board of a specific collection, but it's actually a mood board about Saint Laurent, which physically replaced in the portrait by uh, Bernard Buffet placed at the middle of the wall and his correspondence to the chair. While the aim is to announce the liveness of the making, is a concept that I will get back later, here the danger is to perpetuate an artistic vision of the making of fashion through a sort of uncanny play of objects and images, while the rest of atelier assistants and workers are disappearing behind the image of Saint Laurent. The narrative built in the atelier, the focus of an exhibition, haute couture, the model of representation adopted, the monographic artist museum, reinforce the association between art and fashion, which is also pushing the first room with a parallel between Saint Laurent and Mondrian, and which institute, rather than question, concepts such as originality and creativity in fashion. Saint Laurent is presented in both a museum caption and website with, a term, with terms like creative genius, asserting to a methodology of creative work, which have characterized the discourse on haute couture, rather than expanding his legacy on re in ready to wear. It is in fact important to recognize how the ready-to-wear collection have not been exhibited in museum, despite its centrality in the work of a fashion designer. There was actually an, one exhibition dedicated to, uh, to ready-to-wear, but was not inside the spaces of the museum. So to think about Saint Laurent through the lenses of ready-to-wear, will inevitably demand to rethink models of representation of creative processes, collaborative work, and system of production. This reminds us to this quote that I put here by Richard Martin, who claim the necessity to distance, for example, sportswear industry from the artistic model, but rather place it closer to the architectural one. 
And this is an argument that also Italian scholar Gabriele Monti, who stressed the importance to think about multiple models and system of thinking fashion museum as advanced. And it's something also that I tried also to develop in relation to Momo uh, with this term that I was trying to, to propose as Momo effect, as a way in which we could rethink models of representation by using the tools of fashion design. So when looking at San Lorano Museum, it's also important to notice some evolution in the staging of the atelier in respect to previous installations made for retrospective exhibition at Le Palais, Le Petit Palais, a Denver Art Museum. While in the early cases, the only chairs and figures presented with San Lorano were by, on San Lorano, in this new presentation, chairs, tables, atelier documentation are also added beside the desk of San Lorano uh, in order to reperform this dialogue with the atelier. So to go back to Mikabal and use our words, here the object work as a metonymy, standing for or evoking a presence of workers that interestingly places visitors at the place of the couturier collaborations, confirming what Petrov has described in her book uh, as a form of immersion of the visitors in the exhibition space. As Mikabal argues, museums are places of the rhetorical taxonomies, and in the case of fashion, the rhetoric and discourses about creativity are not only embedded in the figure of a designer, but also in the city itself. This became extremely evident in the exhibition Fashion Mix, which was created by Olivier Sayard in 2015 at the Museum of History of Immigration, Port Doré. The exhibition aimed to reflect the different origins of the creators working with the Parisian haute couture and ready-to-wear industry. This exhibition is a good example of the ways in which Parisian non-fashion museums are today more and more hosting fashion-related exhibitions before someone mentioned the, the, the case of the Bordel, and this is, of course, another example. Uh, as the director of the museum, Luc Gonçon argues, fashion mix was an opportunity, and I'm quoting, to bring the grand public, and especially young visitors, to a museum that talk about the history of, of immigration. End of the quote. And then he continues that his ambition was also, and I'm quoting, to confront an evidence that the brand France consists of a certain savoir faire where French talents are mixed with no French talents who help to enrich its value. End of the quote. Indeed, Sayad's intention were to explore the cosmopolitanism of Parisian fashion industry, the representation of cases of well-known designers. Through the combination of designer pieces, video, personal documentation, uh, the exhibition presented famous cases like Worf or Schiaparelli and categorized from national identity, the Italians, the Belgian, Japan, the Japanese, schools or even groups of designers who moved to Paris or simply came to present their collection. Despite such intention, the exhibition seemed to problematically gather very different stories and perpetuated a national discourse on creativity via territoriality and national belonging, or what Susie Mankins provocatively defined in her Vogue review as the immigration, immigration game. The labels France and Paris are here used with a rhetoric of national discourse already promoted by the industry, and that resonates even more due to the space in which this exhibition were held, which is, as I mentioned before, the Musée de l'histoire de l'immigration, Port Doré, which is also, was originally built as the colonialist exhibition hall or Musée des Colonies in 1931. It is in this sense that it becomes particularly striking to observe how at the end of, of exhibition, visitors were welcomed with a map of the world titled A Chronology of Creators, where multiple arrows were directed from the different countries to Paris. And this map awkwardly reminded a map of a poster um, announcing the exhibition on French uh, colonies in 1931. While this exhibition seemed a great attempt to embrace multiple cultural nature of the industry, it paradoxically backlashed such a perspective, stereotyping and englobing successful designers into a nationalistic discourse on Frenchness that have transformed and renamed non-French designer into icon of Parisianness. And here we just need to think about Alaya or uh, Karl Lagerfeld. So from my point of view, this map is a sort of reminder of the ways in which Paris has a, a big potential, but also a new responsibility to reform a narrative about creative processes, heritage, and, and even the potential or dangers of spaces and geography of fashion in the French capital. Indeed, and it's, um, indeed the city and its spaces become moments for celebration and embodiment of ideologies, but also interesting opportunities to rethink fashion curation beyond this traditional discourse on object and materiality. In this sense, it is useful to go back to the Saint Laurent Museum, uh, which is the first fashion museum erected in the space of a fashion house in Paris, 
Originally designed by Jacques Grange, the interior of the house has partially left intact in order to play on the commerciality of the museum, which is here replaced the client with his visitors, subsequently manifesting an interesting, um, um, an in interesting discourse about the commercial role of museums in today's society. The Sunrise experience opens up a variety of questions on fashion, memory, and historical landscape uh, of fashion in Paris, especially in a moment when streets and spaces of the creation are marked as historical landmarks by the city of Paris. And here we can see the case of Sonia Riquel and uh, Azedine Alaya, who has a plaque affix outside his house in Atelier. I also think that a, a, a more in-depth discourse about the role of heritage uh, could be very useful, especially today, when many luxury brands are opening up departments on heritage, a term that could possibly be more questioned and even extended to alternative geographies of fashion production and consumption in Paris. And here I'm thinking about retail areas like Les Sentiers or even uh, industrial areas such as Pantin, which is outside the periphery of Paris. So the capital of the space and geography was also performed by Dior exhibition, which opened with a recreation of the entrance of the museum, of the Maison. Being the most visited exhibition uh, uh, mad with, with more than 700,000 visitors, the exhibition was created by Olivier Gabé and Florence Muller and have set a, a really a big new standard for exhibition in Paris. Conceived by Les Arts Decoratives, the exhibition was realized with the support of the Maison Christian Dior and the sponsorship of Vat Swarovski. It was the largest fashion exhibition ever held in Paris, 32,000 square meter space and presented an historical display spanning from 1947 to 2017. The exhibition was designed in more than 23 themes, six galleries were dedicated to head designers, uh, rebuilding the Maison rhetoric of the relation between Christian Dior and his successor, from Saint Laurent to Maria Grazia Curie. I must say that while we will need an entire symposium to speak about that, case, uh, I would like to observe, it was really an, a, a groundbreaking exhibition for many, many reasons. I would like to observe on two, two specific issues. The first one is connected to reviews, which is something that Alex Alexandra presented before, uh, and also Amy uh, touched upon in a, in a recent conference when we were in Paris. So uh, in connection to reviews, I would like to say how it was very interesting when I was preparing this, this paper to, uh, to notice a sort of descriptive, and I would say even a critical nature of the commentary about fashion exhibition in the French press, especially if compared to the very harsh view uh, in other countries. And here I, I put just the example of this review on the Dior exhibition now at VNA by Rachel Cook uh, for The Guardian, entitled Christian Dior, Designer of Dreams Review, Style over Substance, question mark. And this indeed opened up a big chapter uh, in the study of exhibition uh, and the way in which we rebuild the history of exhibition. Um, and, I, and I think that's a, a very important uh, aspect to, to start looking into also for the French um, scenario. The other aspect that I wanted to discuss uh, about uh, the Dior exhibition, which is more close to something that I've been working recently, is the idea of staging labor. In fact, the Dior Expo, Expo followed a recurrent practice of exhibiting the workers, a showcase artisans from the atelier who, in silence, performed the making of leather bags or letting visitors try perfumes in the exhibition space, while behind them, as you can see from the images here, uh, there were shown historical images of Atelier at Chez Dior. The stage of labor has been a recurrent practice that strangely dialogue with the LVMH events titled Les Journées Particulières where visitors can pay a ticket to enter the atelier or a mise-en-scene of, of the real atelier and see stream seamstresses or artisans at work, as you can see in the case of the Givenchy uh, event in 2016, which I, I've been and was quite of an interesting uh, experience because you were walking through this black uh, room where uh, workers were put on a props and dressed in white and you could not say anything, you could not take picture, and there was uh, this kind of a, a surreal silence. So all the performances, visitors, in all these performances, visitors are not any more consumers of the commodity, but they hear spectators of more intriguing mechanism where the act of making becomes the exhibited object. By looking at the body of a worker, the hands, the fingers, their know-how, visitors are faced with sentiment of admiration and self-projections that transform the making into a discursive practice able to instigate pleasure and desire. As I argue in an article for Luca Marchetti book on curating, these performances stage the liveness of fashion. My use of the term liveness comes from uh, a performance theory and authors like Philip Auslander, who referred to the capacity of live performances 
uh, and he speaks about mainly concert, to encapsulate the beginning time, but also suggests that this liveness become a symbol of our current economy based on recording and reproduction. Such ideas is extremely useful, I think, if we look back at fashion and these stages of labor, which catapult us in front of the idea of fashion as an economy of the live and not only an economy of the new. The live in fashion is not only a matter of recording, but it's also a capitalistic tool used to activate and evoke the multiple facade of an economy built on the need to instigate the animate into the inanimate. The perform of a work in museum and exhibition, like the or in the sense, show this character, but also show us how museums are today dispositives participating to this econo economic mechanism of life. In order to better understand the complexity of these performative practices in exhibition, I believe we will have to insert this tendency into a larger framework of exhibiting craft and heritage. And it could be also useful to contextualize these experiences in connection to the ways in which art institutions in France have been exploring the relation between culture, art, uh, the artisan, and the space of labor. Like in the case of, uh, of the image that you can see on your right uh, uh, of the exhibition, Art Comes to the Artisan, held at the Renault factory in 1961. Here, Renault organized an exhibition in the canteen of a factory, uh, exhibiting artwork for major uh, museums such as the Louvre. In the case of the Dior exhibition, or at the MH, uh, Journée Particulière, we see a contrary action. The workers are here asked to perform the value and stage a new frontier of fashion exhibitions, where entertainment is not only guaranteed by the spectacular exhibition design or uh, digital interactions, but also via the performance of the making. In this sense, it is useful to look at the work of Olivier Sayat to observe a more calibrated use of performance as alternative tools to retrospectively uh, exhibit fashion. With performances like The Impossible Wardrobe or The Clock Room, Sayad questioned the ways in which fashion remains, using the performance to reenact sensibilities and memories of fashion. Like in the case of modern Never Talk, age model bodies uh, are used to, as archives, able to reenact form of disciplinization of a body in the industry, but also redonate agency to models as interpreters of fashion. In particular, a very last performance at the Centre National de la Danse seems to synthesize many of the issues that I tried to discuss before in relation uh, to issues of what is a museum, voices of autoriality, and even representation of creative work. Titled L'Atelier de Couture, the performance celebrates the work on an atelier assistant, Madame Lenoir, who worked for uh, Madame Gray, and who staged techniques of draping and pleating via the creation of haute couture t-shirts. Interestingly, here we're back to the atelier, but the protagonist now uh, becomes the assistant, and her gesture of couture are reenacting on a jersey materials, which is worn by Madame Gray fitting model, Axel Du. The idea is to contrast the exceptionality of the techniques with the everydayness of a t-shirt. Furthermore, the performance brings the importance of oral history and embodied knowledge in fashion, as Sayad invites uh, Madame Lenoir to speak about her work, interact with the spectators, showing the participative, the participative nature of performances and also the potential of performances, rather than creating a mute diorama of labor. Sayad performances urge the opening of new frontiers and discussion on the model of representation of fashion, but also its institutionalization in museum in France, which is also an issue that we try to tackle at the MA in Fashion Studies at Parson Paris, where, sorry, this was the other one, where, um, where we collaborate with museums like MoMU and Galliera to reflect on paradigm and institutional discourses, like in the case of this exhibition, Objet d'Etude, the, uh, the politics of the study collection in the Fashion Museum. Here we collaborated with the Fashion Museum of Antwerp and proposed to look at the ways the study collection, an entity that does not uh, officially exist, there are some study collection of course, but they don't exist as a, as a museological entity in France, can subvert ideas of perfection and economic value that govern the, uh, the Fashion Museum. The exhibition staged this potential, inviting visitors to look at the construction of value via bureaucratic documentation, and here we showed some documentation which was created by in the making of the exhibition, where uh, many, um, the, the, even the price, when we were asking uh, for the loans to Momo, the prices of the garment were actually created in theory because initially they had no economic value. Or even by pushing visitors to interact with the imperfection of garment via magnified lenses. To conclude, I look, I, I like to go back to Billy's idea of a paradox, to observe that the disparity between centrality of, fresh, of French fashion industry and its presence in museum has been, of course, over, overcome today. 
However, the paradox is now that this relation has been exaggerated at a point where discoursing museums tend to too often mimic the techniques, rhetoric, and languages of industry, inevitably provoking an understanding that fashion in France is still discoursed as a phenomenon of luxury and exclusiveness rather than everyday culture and inclusiveness, something that already Billy denounced in his article in 51, where he was presenting and proposing different, uh, different form of collecting practices. This aspect brings me to another paradox. Today, the critical attitude that surrounded the entrance of fashion in museums has become actually strengthened. The commercial nature of fashion in comparison to other fields like art, for example, may mitigate the shift that all museums are currently experiencing from pure institution of knowledge into commercial enterprises. This may transform the Parisian and French landscape into a central space of investigation, but also to the presence of two main luxury conglomerates is today embracing the triumvirate, fashion, the museum, and consumerism. And I just wanted to show this, uh, this slide, which was uh, two days ago, a show by um, Guesquier uh, uh, with uh, Louis Vuitton, where he actually performed, he recreated Pompidou at the Louvre. So here we have another, another level of a, a museum within a museum. Uh, but this was not actually, I think, the, the example that I wanted to show where this kind of uh, dialogue between fashion museum and consumerism can be really uh, bring us to a, another level of discussion. Uh, but what I wanted to show in, in relation to this triumvirate is actually the work and the current exhibition of Atelier EB Passerby uh, stage at Lafayette Anticipation, which is a new space for contemporary exhibition owned by the department stores Lafayette. Originally conceived for the Serpentine Gallery, in London, the exhibition is created by Lucy McKenzie and Becca Limscob as a reflection of a history of displaying bodies in both museum and commercial spaces, while it also reveals a first archaeology of fashion exhibitions. Once again, the term atelier appears, but here we assist more to a laboratory to rethink fashion museography, as the exhibition is a creation of allusion and vocations, displaying mannequins and documentation from seminal fashion exhibitions, but also reconstructing commercial spaces, allowing visitors to even buy the creation made by the duo artist. Particularly interesting is also the presentation of a handrail of the Galerie Lafayette staircase, which was originally created in 1912 by the architect Ferdinand Chanou, and now is conserved at the Lafayette archive, and for the exhibition were revitalized with wooden stairs by Les Ateliers Majorelles. So the complexity and subtle discourse on commercial and artistic gestures, the discourse, the discourse around authenticity and reproduction, the dialogue between heritage and innovation, is at the core of Mackenzie and Lipsko, um, exhibition. And this represents, I believe, a phenomen phenomenal and innovative fresh, fresh approach that will hopefully help us to question all the multiple paradoxes and potential at play in the way we think the exhibition of fashion in Paris. Thank you.